So my name is Eric Hoagland. I'm on the Educational Outreach Committee for Microscopy Society of America Student Council. Uh, we have a great team of students who run uh, all sorts of activities, anywhere from the pre-meeting Congress at m, m every year. If you have not attended, I highly recommend it. It's for students, postdocs, early career professionals, and it's a whole day of an extra conference, a uh, great networking opportunity. Uh, this is one of the events that we are hosting this year. It's a new one where uh, it's called Microscopy Live, and the intent is that we show you microscopy happening live, uh, in part for um, kind of background information. We can give you kind of uh, where all these theory of the microscope and uh, the different techniques uh, stem from, in addition to showing you practical usage of the techniques themselves. Uh, some quick housekeeping items. Uh, we do have MSA t-shirts for sale. Um, then I also mentioned earlier the PMC. This is the uh, pre-meeting for M&M. Uh, we highly encourage everybody to attend that. It's a great extra day of the conference. I think Wempe, we actually uh, gave a presentation there two years ago. It was a very nice talk. Um, for people joining in Zoom, raise your hand during uh, any part of the webinar today and we can unmute you and you can ask questions. This is meant to be a live interactive experience. Uh, so if you see something while uh, Tim is giving a demonstration and you don't understand what's happening, just let us know and we can, uh, we'll can unmute you and you can show us right there and, and he will let you know. Um, so first I wanna introduce uh, Wempe. He's a professor at NC State. I think he was at uh, University of California, California Irvine before. Uh, he is now a professor at NC State doing the same great material science and a lot of um, diffraction related techniques such as 40 STEM and IDPC. Uh, and then sitting next to him, who you can see is Tim, who is in his group as well. And he will be giving you the demonstration today. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Wempe. He'll give you a quick uh, introductory talk and introduce a couple other people as well. Yeah, thank you, Eric and Laura. Uh, it's really nice we have this opportunity to talk to uh, you know people from all over the world who are interested in uh, not only 4D stand but also microscopy in general. Uh, I like this virtual uh, format actually because that gives us this uh, very nice flexibility to do this, no matter where you are and uh, what it, what the time is. Right. Uh, so today, I think uh, I can just share the video uh, with you. Let me see if that works. You're seeing it right now, right? It just came up, yep. Okay, yeah. Hello everyone, it is our pleasure to meet all of you virtually in this platform. I would like to say that it is really great with the webinar of Microscopy Live, organized by Students Council of MSA, we can talk about four-dimensional scanning transmission electron microscopy, 4D STEM here. We will first briefly talk about what is 4D STEM, how to do it, and some basic applications. We also invited the students from three institutes. Tim Eldred from NC State will show us the experimental setup in our lab for both DPC imaging and the 4D STEM acquisition. Zhen Liang Yuan from University of Illinois will talk about application 4D STEM in uh, stream mapping. And Chris Adiego from University of California will focus on 4D STEM applications at different uh, dimensions. In regular STEM mode, an electron beam is converged into an uh, electron probe with its size determined by the convergence angle and the lens aberration. To take an image, the probe is raster scanned across the sample and the electrons scattered to different angles are collected by detectors and counted to yield a number as the pixel intensity. But in fact, convergent beam electron diffraction, seabed patterns, form in the diffraction plane. If we study the diffraction pattern from each location, the local structure information, more than just the image intensity, can be retrieved. This requires us to record the diffraction pattern while the beam is scanning. 
The acquisition of 2D diffraction pattern at each location in a scanning image is now called 4D STEM, as shown here. A 4D STEM experiment can be as simple as synchronizing a diffraction camera with the beam scan and acquiring the entire diffraction at each scanning pixel. Depending on the conditions used to manipulate the electron beams in the TEM, the diffraction can be a nanobeam electron diffraction or CBAD. In the early works, for example, this one from Jingtao, by scanning a nanometer-sized electron beam on the sample, electron nanodiffraction imaging, ND, can be acquired. In LCMO, when the electron beam sits on an area with structural modulations, the diffraction pattern has the diffuse superlattice reflections, labeled SR here. By plotting the intensity of the superlattice reflections obtained from the diffraction patterns, uh, we can reconstruct the contour map showing the distribution of the superlattice phase. And here, by carefully examining the intensity distribution of the partially overlapped CBAD patterns, averaged in the local area called PACBAD, and compare with simulation, Jim LeBeau and the Stammers group show that you can measure and actually map the local thickness and the tilt in the sample. And here, uh, Kenji Suda's work shows with the CBAD uh, disks well separated, scanning CBAD can map the local phase and the polarization in bismuth titanate. This is done by comparing the intensity and its distribution within these OO2 reflections. The obstacle in 4D STEM is the speed, because you will need to take nice diffraction at each probe location to get a map, which was quite time consuming and can challenge the sample and instrument stability. Recent advances in, instrument, in instrumentation now enable 4D STEM to be taken in aberration corrected STEM at high spatial resolution with high frequency. For example, Gaten K2 camera can run at a speed of 1000 frames per second. An MPAD detector designed at Cornell also offers 1000 frames per second acquisition of images with high dynamic range. Morning EM can run up to 10,000 frames per second. Of course, there are also other options. With both the new detectors and methods for data analysis, 4D STEM now allows the measurement, imaging, and quantification of various properties, including symmetry, strain, polarization, electric, and, and magnetic field in functional materials. For instance, you can put virtual masks in the diffraction and reconstruct the bright field, annular bright field, and dark field images. 4D STEM also enables the application of electron tachography, as demonstrated by Professor Rodenberg. Recently, by doing tachography at low KV, Professor Muller's group shows the spatial resolution can be pushed to close to 0.4 angstrom for low voltage STEM. And here, with the CBAT disk slightly separated, by quantifying the locations of the diffraction disks, 4D STEM can map strain at high precision. It has also been established that by fitting CBAT results with theory, you can get a high resolution map of three dimensional charges in oxide, such as cuprate, and metal, such as aluminum. Here we will just focus on one of the applications imaging the electric field. The idea is very straightforward. When we look at this part where the electron beam interact with the sample, if the electron beam size is small and the sample is thin, the electrons penetrate the sample can feel a local electric field, mostly from the internal of the sample. The electrons will be shifted by the local electric field and has a momentum perpendicular to the optical axis. This momentum can be measured from the shift of the diffraction intensity from the pattern captured now by the high-speed pixelated electron detectors. We first show this with an STO sample. So this is an STO unicell overlaid on a hard F stem image. And here's how 4D stem is done. At each probe location, we get a diffraction. And this is the display of the data set from a stem unicell. By calculating how the center of the diffraction shifts, we can derive the local electric field and then mapping it over the entire area. You see that the electric field is radially distributed around the atoms, points from the atom center to away from them. Then in BFO, bismuth ferrite, we know it has spontaneous polarization. 
In the rhombohedral phase, the polarization is along the body diagonal. In a hard depth stem image, we can see how the bismuth atoms shift away from the geometric center of the four ion atoms. And now with the electric field map, we can see that there is a deformation of the electric field, with it polarizing oppositely to the shift of the bismuth atom. We know that from Gauss law, the local electric charges can be calculated if you know the electric field. And in two dimension, we can use the differential form, the Poisson equation, to derive the projection of charges by doing a diversion to the electric field map. Here are the maps of the projected charge for STO and BFO, calculated from the corresponding field map. Negative charges are colored in red, positive charges are colored in blue. With the charge map from BFO, we can separate the positive charges from it and calculate the weighted center of the positive charge. And similarly, we can isolate the negative charge from the map and get the weighted center of the negative charge. By showing how they are separated in real space, we actually can image the dipole moment in a BFO unicell projected in two dimension. In 4D stem image, we can also locate the positions of uh, each atom, define the boundary of the atom charge by searching for the local minima in the map, and then integrate the charge intensity inside of the area to calculate the total atomic charge. Here is the example measurement using several perovskite oxide materials. We find a very good linear relationship of the measured total charge with those derived in DFT calculations. Basically, with 4D stem, we can examine multiple materials properties. At the atomic scale, we can measure the polarization, we can see the electric field, and the projected charge map can be calculated and used to measure the total charge of atoms. And the next, Chris will show you how electric interaction can be probed at the different scales using 4D stem. And then Ren Liang will talk about stream measurement. After the talks, Tim here will be hosting the live 4D STEM experiment. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Adiego. I'm from Professor Pan's group at UC Irvine. Uh, and I'm gonna be discussing multi-scale electric field imaging and ferroelectrics with 4D STEM. So ferroelectrics are materials where the atomic structure exhibits a spontaneous polarization. Uh, like ferromagnets, they can form complex domain patterns, making high-resolution characterization important for understanding their properties. TM, TM imaging methods allow us to study the domain structure on a variety of length scales. Uh, diffraction contrast, TM, allows us to study the polarization uh, patterns as a whole at the scale of hundreds of nanometers. Uh, and then aberration corrected stem, allows us to measure the polarization of individual unit cells by mapping the displacement of individual atomic columns. And then finally, stem spectroscopy allows us to measure the chemical composition and study electronic properties of these materials. However, there's a new technique emerging and uh, it's called 4D stem. So in contrast to conventional uh, stem imaging where one pixel value is collected per probe position. In 4D stem, we collect an entire image of the diffraction pattern for every probe position. So this gives us a 2D image for every position in the 2D scan, which results in a 4D data set. So you can calculate a wide variety of quantities from this data. However, uh, I'm most interested in studying the electric field in the sample. And this can be quantified by calculating the shift in the center of mass of each diffraction pattern. Uh, and then this can be related to the electric field in the sample. So there have been several successful studies using this method on ferroelectrics. Um, so at UC Irvine, we use this to measure the charge separation across the strontium titanate bismuth ferrite interface. And then group in Europe uh, has used this to measure or to show that the electric field is enhanced in calcium doped layers in bismuth ferrite. And then a group at UC Berkeley uh, was able to observe regions of negative capacitance in a lead titanate, strontium titanate superlattice. Since this is a relatively new technique, uh, the community is still working out how to best interpret the results and how experimental conditions can influence the measurement. 
this can lead to some surprising results. Uh, so in our work at UC Irvine, we observed that the electric field uh, surrounding individual atoms has a strong bias pointed opposite to the polarization. Uh, however, uh, in the work done at UC Berkeley, their uh, measured electric field does not have an obvious relationship to the polarization. And the key difference between these two works was the uh, probe conditions used. In our case, we use an atomic resolution probe highly, with high convergence angle, and they use a nanometer resolution probe with low convergence angle. So in my talk today, uh, I'm going to be examining how the probe conditions can affect the electric field that you measure with 4D stem, uh, which field is being measured in each case for different probe uh, conditions, and how this relates to the properties of the material. And the model system we're going to be using is uh, the vortex structures in lead titanate, strontium titanate superlabs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the probe conditions we used. Uh, for the atomic resolution probe, we used a convergence angle of 32 millirad. Uh, this corresponds to a full width half max of about 0 0.6 angstroms. So this can e easily resolve individual atoms in perovskite. Uh, for the nanometer probe, uh, we used 2.4 millirad convergence angle. This corresponds to full width half max of about 4 angstroms. So this covers the entire unit cell in most perovskite oxides, including uh, both STO and PTO. The electric field can be measured using the same principle in both cases. Uh, due to its size, a 32 millirad probe can measure the electric field surrounding individual atoms. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the 2.4 millirad probe does not have the spatial resolution to resolve uh, atomic columns, but it can still measure the electric field over larger length scales. So the polarization can be measured in both probe conditions as well. Uh, with a high resolution probe, uh, we use conventional displacement mapping uh, from a simultaneously collected high angle angular dark field image. Uh, however, this is not possible with the 2.4 millirad probe since the spatial resolution is much lower. Uh, however, there is still a way to measure the polarization. Uh, in ferroelectrics, the polarization of the unit cell breaks the symmetry of the structure. Uh, and this same broken symmetry is reflected in the diffraction pattern and its asymmetric intensity in conjugate pair diffraction disks. Uh, therefore, by quantifying this intensity asymmetry in the 4D stem data, uh, we can measure the polarization in the material. So we'll start with our atomic resolution electric field map. Um, on the left is the conventional displacement mapping from this region, and on the right is the electric, atomic resolution electric field map. Uh, if we zoom in, uh, we can see that we've resolved the lead, titanium, and oxygen columns in the PTO layer. Um, and we can also start to see that some of the atomic columns exhibit an asymmetric electric field. So we further analyze the atomic resolution electric field map to determine the overall pattern in the electric field. Uh, to do this, we isolate uh, the lead atomic columns in the electric field map, and then we average the electric field within a radius of about one angstrom surrounding each column. Uh, in this case, and now the electric field, average electric field is shown in red. So repeating this process for the entire data set, these are the results. Uh, since the electric field is generally radially distributed, uh, this method will show us if there is any preferential direction in the electric field of each lead column due to the polarization of the unit cell. Uh, if we overlay the average electric field with the HADF map, uh, then the overall trend becomes clear. Uh, we can see the electric field shows a similar vortex pattern, however, uh, pointing the opposite direction. Uh, this is because the electric field is generally defined to point opposite to the polarization. This pattern can be attributed to the polarization bound charge that occurs at the edges of the ferroelectric layer. Uh, this bound charge generates an electric field pointing opposite to the polarization direction in the material. A uh, recent simulation study using BFO as a model system demonstrated that this depolarization field can generate asymmetries in the electric field surrounding individual atoms as measured by 4D stem. Uh, in the super lattice, the vortex structures uh, generate in alternating positive negative regions along the edges of the PTO layer. Uh, this configuration of the bound charge would generate exactly the same uh, de depolarization field as the pattern that we observed in 4D stem. 
Uh, so now moving on to our results from the low convergence angle probe um, versus the polarization map from this region as calculated from the uh, conjugate pair diffraction disks shows that this region covers approximately three vortices. However, uh, the electric field map as calculated for the center disk doesn't show the strong vortex pattern as it did previously. So to understand this, uh, we've been working with a group from Penn State University that specializes in phase field simulations. Uh, so phase field simulations can calculate the stable polarization and electric field configuration in the material by minimizing the total free energy of the system, uh, which depends on the electrostatic and elastic boundary conditions in the material. Uh, so comparing our experimental results with the uh, electric field and polarization from phase field simulation, we can see that the electric field measured with this, this method corresponds much more closely with the total electric field as calculated by phase field uh, simulations. Well, therefore, the key difference between these two probe conditions uh, comes down to the interaction volume and probe width. In the case of the atomic resolution probe, uh, it's small enough that the electric field measurement is dominated by the field of individual atoms. Uh, since the depolarization introduces asymmetries into the atomic electric field, this is detected by the small probe. However, uh, the much weaker and slowly varying total electric field is not visible. Uh, in the case of the nanometer resolution probe, uh, the electric field of individual atoms is averaged out because it covers several within its interaction volume. Uh, and the asymmetry uh, caused by the depolarization field is not detectable. However, for the same reason, since it, the atomic field is no longer dominating, uh, the total electric field is now visible in the electric field map. So in conclusion, uh, we've shown that uh, measurements of the electric field with an atomic resolution probe corresponds to the depolarization field in the ferroelectric. Uh, however, measurement with a nanometer resolution probe matches with the total electric field is based on phase field simulations. So therefore, the depolarization field and the total electric field are separable by changing the probe size. And uh, both are important for understanding the overall behavior of the ferroelectric. I'd like to thank you for listening and thank my collaborators for the help on this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. And uh, if you uh, if you have any questions, you can just virtually raise your hand or uh, uh, type something in the chat box, so we will respond to it. Uh, so, Korea. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. It was a great opportunity to join you. Uh, actually, I have a very simple question uh, that why we called it 4D. Uh, I searched on the net and I found that it's uh, that we can study the 2D uh, in two direction, two, in two dimensions. So we called it 4D. Do you have any, but I honestly, I didn't understand. So do you have any more explanations? Okay. So uh, to put it short, basically we are scanning a two-dimensional area and at each pixel we are getting this two-dimensional diffraction pattern. So basically that's 2D by 2D, so it's 4D. Yeah. And it's in a scanning transmission electron microscopy mode. That's why it's called the 4D scan. So yeah, Chris, you have anything <laughs> to add? Yeah. The, the 4D uh, corresponds to the four dimensions in the data, not to four spatial dimensions. Or yeah or 3D plus time, it's not that. It's the data we analyze and collect is four dimensional. Okay, that's great, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also I have another question that, uh, uh, do you have any idea where can be selected the reference area? Where is the best place for reference area for uh, studying a multi-layer sample in field? Uh, okay, so the signal is kind of intermediate. Uh, can you repeat your question? Uh, in this technique, we need to uh, select an area as a reference 
to come as a reference. Okay. As a reference, yes. So for a multi-layer tin film, I would like to know that where is the best place, to, if uh, it's the substrate or the bulk material, or. Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, obviously we all have this same kind of issue, right? Every time if you want to decide whether it's a polarization or it's just an artifact. So Chris, you want to answer it? Um, that's our study with the BFOSTO system, right? Yeah. So for us, we, uh, we generally either use the average of the whole data mm -hmm. set as the reference um, so that will tell us variations within one data set. Or uh, if you have the capacity and the speed and you can include like a large area of the substrate where it has known properties that aren't, aren't being modified by an interface, uh, then that works too. Um, but right often we're kind of constrained by the speed of our camera and the step size that we want to use. So that's not always possible. Yeah, what I also want to add to it is um... Uh, if possible, you can also just scan a vacuum area, you know, at a very high max. So basically, if you don't see this, the disk scan issue. But if your probe is also moving in the reciprocal space, then this sometimes will create more artifacts. So it, it, it all depends. The best way is to, you know, decide where your probe is without the sample. So that will be the, uh, the right reference to use. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Alejandra. Thank you so much for that presentation. <clears throat> uh, it was very beautiful. I just have a quick question about what is the criteria to choose the step size, especially in the nanometer probe, because in the uh, atomic probe, you can choose a small step as you want, but if we're constrained, constrained to the around, I think you say two Armstrong, that is the the, the, the size of the probe in the nanometer, uh, is it worth it to go step size smaller than that? Uh, I think, uh, so Tim later on will show you uh, some you know, live body stem experiment. How do we set up the uh, step size? And then Leon and Chris, they have more experience uh, in using this uh, micro probe, right, in stem mode. So then Leon. <laughs> Then yes. is a, a PhD student who is expert in body stem uh, with the machine learning applied to the data analysis. So can you try to answer this question? So uh, basically the step size will determine the resolution in our map generated by the 4D stem technique. And so that is uh, largely based on what, what you need. So if you have a large sample and you, you just want to have a green mapping, and you can set the step size to be several nanometers uh, perfectly okay. But in the case, I think in the uh, Chris talk, they are talking about atomic resolution in electric field. So in that case, I think the step size must be very small. I think it should be a uh, sub -length strong. Yeah, yeah, that's really a really good question. So we can introduce Yanya's talk uh, maybe two minutes later after uh, we talk to Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Wang Pei. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Uh, very nice presentation and uh, introduction. Uh, I have actually a question regarding uh, one slide. In, you introduced different cameras uh, possible to be used for 4D STEM, uh -huh. including like a one view K2 and EMPAD and also Medi, uh, Medipix based. Yeah. Have you ever compared what's the difference? Uh, different I mean, what's the differences between those uh, uh, detectors regarding the 4D STEM? So they have different yeah. maxes. Okay. So there's a, a whole different range of things that the different detectors do better and worse than each other. You've got detectors like the MPAD, which is what we have here at NC State, which boasts just a really high dynamic range. It's really radiation hard. You can drop a direct beam on it, never worry about burning it in, but it has limitations based off of, uh, it's a small detector size. It's only 128 by 128 pixels. The, the K2 has a, a larger spatial resolution, same refresh rate, but it's not quite as radiation hard. You've got detectors like uh, the one that Andy Miner is using uh, with the really, really high uh, refresh rate, but it requires you to basically build the infrastructure of your building, your entire data infrastructure, 
around one detector because it puts out that much data. So there's a large dependence on what you want to look at that kind of dictates which detector would be the best for that purpose. So one of the great things about the MPAD is you can at the same time capture the direct beam in a spot diffraction pattern and also capture thermal diffuse scattering in second order Lowy zone disks. You can capture this whole range linearly without either saturating the detector or losing the, the uh, single electron sensitivity. But that's at a trade off of total pixel size and spatial resolution. So there are, yeah, there are a lot of papers literally on uh, looking at individual detectors and what they do. Um, but there's not one that's just best for 4D STEM. They're just different applications um, that you're looking at. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for the interest of time, I suggest we just move on to Renliang's talk since uh, he's still here. So Renliang has other duties after 4 p.m. today. So there we go. Let me share the talk from Renliang. Hello everyone, I am Ren Liang Yun from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I am a PhD student in Professor Chen Mingzuo's group. Today I am presenting our recent development of machine learning based crystal orientation and lattice stream mapping using the 4D stem. However, we are using a small convergence angle. I will talk about why we need this setup and how do we get information from this. TEM has been a useful tool to characterize microstructures of materials. For example, diffraction contrast imaging is the most popular method to visualize defects for more than 50 years. The contrast in the image comes from the lattice bending near the defects. However, if we look at a com complete expression of the lattice deformation, we can see that it, it is, can be decomposed into rotation part and the pure string. While the pure string is directly related to electrical and mechanical properties, only the two terms in the out-of-plane rotation part can contribute to the contrast in the uh, cont diffraction contrast imaging. What if we want to know more information here quantitatively? Actually, it can be achieved by some other methods. For example, Orientation mapping aims to measure the out-of-plane rotation, the red terms, quantitatively. While the stream mapping techniques can be used to uh, measure the in-plane string and the in-plane rotation quantitatively. The experimental technique we used is called scanning electron nanodiffraction, which works similarly to a typical 4D stem, but with a much smaller convergence angle. So the benefit of using a smaller convergence angle is that we have a diffraction disks not overlapping with each other. The benefit is that it allows us to quantitatively analyze each diffraction order individually. However, the downside is that we sacrifice some spatial resolution due to the small convergence angle. However, we can still reach about one nanometer spatial resolution with a one millirad convergent beam. After the data acquisition of this 4D stem, we can get a huge number of diffraction patterns. Our next major task is to find a way to analyze this big, big, big data set and do it efficiently. In the past few years, machine learning has revolutionized many fields, exemplify the success of AlphaGo mastering the board game Go, which was once perceived as impossible. In the computer vision, deep learning has also gained great success in classification of complicated images by learning from huge datasets. And our purpose here is to try to use machine learning to help us uh, automatically analyze the huge 4D stem datasets to extract information of orientation mapping and the stream mapping. The orientation mapping, uh, the orientation of a crystal can be determined by the geometry and intensity of the diffraction peaks. Traditionally, this is achieved by comparing an experimental diffraction pattern with the simulation database. 
and to find the best match. However, there are some drawbacks to this method. One is that the uh, simulation is usually done with the kinematical diffraction, and that is not so accurate with the real experimental case. And another thing is that the computation time is direct pro directly proportional to the simulation library size, which means if we want to increase the, the resolution or sensitivity in the angular space, we need to we have to increase the computation time, which is not that good, especially when we consider that we have a lot of diffraction patterns in our 4D stem data set. So we propose a new method to use the artificial neural networks to do the orientation mapping for us. The key points are that we first simulate diffraction patterns instead of using kinematical theory, we use the dynamical theory to do that, to do the simulation and we generate a large data, diffraction database for the artificial neural network. And secondly, we reduce the orientation range to a certain zone, because in most cases, we already know a rough zone axis. And thirdly, we redu uh, since we use a small convergence angle with separated diffraction peaks, so we can reduce each diffraction disk into one integrated intensity so here, an entire image can be reduced to only 43 numbers. And this greatly simplified the, the structure of our artificial network, which allows us to train this network very fast. And here is an example of using our machine learning method to get the orientation mapping of the small green subdivision in the nuclear field material after irradiation. So here is a, a bright field image of the uh, polycrystal uranium oxide. The, there are uh, originally three green, big grains uh, separated by the yellow uh, green boundaries. And uh, after irradiation, we took a 4D stem data set at this uh, orange box. Uh, by averaging all diffraction patterns within the scan, we can see there are, uh, this is roughly a one, one single grain, but there are small variations in it. So after applying our orientation mapping uh, method to the data set, we can generate the orientation map. And we can clearly observe uh, these small subgrains and with only less than about one or two degrees in misorientation with each other. And that is not, uh, not detectable by other methods. So if we take a closer look at the diffraction pattern uh, took from this position A and B and compare with the simulation, the simulated diffraction patterns uh, automatically matched from our machine learning method. You can see the, the result is pretty robust. And actually we can estimate, uh, estimate the, our angular sensitivity to be about 0 0.01 degree compared with the traditional method with only about 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 degree, which is a, a very big improvement. Uh, the second uh, example is the lattice stream measurement, which can be done in using the diffraction through the Bragg's law. And in our 2D diffraction case, we just need to measure the, the problem re is reduced to measuring the position of each diffraction peaks. However, when we have a for the stem diffraction, we have a convergent beam, we have a disk. The traditional peak detection results will fail due to the non-uniform distribution from the dynamic diffraction. So we develop a new convolutional natural neural network based method to do the diffraction disk detection. It is achieved by uh, stimulating a, a large number of diffraction patterns and diffraction disks with different dif diffuse uh, intensity distribution and do the training. So after that, we can reach a, a detection sensitivity of about 0 0.1 pixel in this diffraction disk. After detecting all the diffraction disks, we can calculate the stream map. Here is an example of a stream mapping on a FinFET transistor device. And we previously developed another method using the circular half transform, which is also very uh, good at detecting the non-uniform disk based on the dynamical diffraction. And if we compare with these two methods, compare these two methods, we can see that our new convolutional neural network methods can perform better in some cases with 
better precision. So here, basically, the uh, the map is more smoother than the uh, circular half transform results, and also that we can have we can reach uh, four times faster speed using our machine learning based methods. So in summary, we have uh, shown that the 4D SAM or SAM method is a very powerful technique to get the latest distortion information with high precision and high spatial resolution. And we show that we how to use the machine learning to help us analyze the big 4D SAM data sets. And also that we showed uh, two examples of our orientation mapping and the lattice stream mapping to get more information from the deformation, uh, Gladys deformation. And here is all of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Renliang. Excellent work. Okay, I think now we can have uh, maybe three to five minutes uh, for questions. Then we get our 40 time online. Okay, Sarah. Hey, um, thank you for this talk. I think it's really um, exciting. I just have one question about the convolutional neural network. So uh, first, I'm curious about input data. So do you put the whole CBAT pattern um, as one training sample or you just put a disk pattern as a training sample? So uh, yeah, that is a good question. So that depends on uh, my, uh, what's the application. So in uh, my first example, we use uh, intensity to calculate the orientation. So in that case, we use the in entire pattern reduced to a number of integrated intensity. So that is only uh, about tens of 20, 20 uh, disk, disk intensity integrated. And the second case, we need to find the position of the diffraction disk. So the input is a uh, is a sub image containing only one diffraction disk. Okay, so, uh, but I saw actually in your first model, you just use, um, let's say one layer, right? Is it a convolutional layer or it is just a fully connected layer? In the first example, it's only a fully con con connected layer. It's a very simple model. Okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ren Liang. Any other questions? Uh, okay, there's a question pop up in the chatting box. That's the combination of a sand and small convergence angle technique, direct electron detectors and the appropriate uh, machine learning technique obviate the need for uh, precession electron diffraction. <laughs> uh, Ren Liang, you can answer this. This is, uh, I think, uh, Professor Zhuo, right? He, he once talked about this. Yes, yes. So a lot of people are doing precession electron diffraction and uh, the major purpose is to uh, to get rid of the multi -dif uh, multiple diffraction uh, issue within the disk. So, so our practical limit is that in our microscope, we cannot do scanning within the precession mode. So that motivates me to find other ways to to solve this issue. Then, then I come up with some other methods to to measure the strain and measure the orientation with, with the those uh, with those multiple dynamical diffraction signal within the disk. And after that, we when we compare with the uh, precession electron diffraction, um, so we think our major advantage is that uh, we don't have to increase this complexity in the data acquisition. So our probe is theoretically our electron probe can be smaller. So we can reach higher spatial resolution. And also for the orientation mapping, since uh, the, if you are ro uh, rocking the beam, you are already averaging the orientation, then you sacrifice some uh, precision. That is another advantage of our method you, without using the precession. Yeah, and also uh, I believe precession diffraction is still uh, needed, right, for crystallography. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So. Again, so this depends on what you need. So That's if you want to do a very, uh, you know, uh, serious crystallography with, uh, with a sample, maybe precession diffraction is what you need. But if you want to uh, have a really 
uh, large field of view screen mapping, uh, probably this uh, sand technique, uh, and also layered with uh, this machine learning technique will be the way to go. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, now maybe this is a more exciting part. Hmm. So we didn't formally introduce our lab. So this is our uh, TM lab. Okay, so this is a Titan microscope. What's behind me are the six screens that we use and also the operator, <laughs> Tim. Tim is a fourth year PhD student working on electron microscopy uh, in NC State. And this microscope locates in the AIF analytical instrumentation uh, facility. And now Tim is sharing the screen with you that shows all the four PCs we're gonna use today, including a TIA uh, PC that operates the microscope, uh, two screen for the Velox, uh, which we use to acquire the hard stem image and the bright field image, of course, and also DPC image, and also the uh, 40 stem PC that's uh, from the MPAD. And I will just open the floor for Tim. So as, uh, as Wenpei was talking about, we have in the bottom left is Tia, which drives the actual microscope normally. The right two monitors are both Velox. It's another Thermo Fisher uh, software that we use to do most of our data acquisition, including if you look in the top right, we have a DPC data set that's already open. DPC uh, approximates the electric field imaging that they were talking about in the earlier talk. Uh, but the downside to doing it with DPC is number one, it's only an approximation. And number two, since it's using a segmented detector, once you acquire the data, if you later discover that your beam was slightly out of sync, and this goes back to the question earlier about reference, there's nothing you can do. This data exists. You can't ever change it. You can't go back early and tweak it. The calculations are already done. So let's go ahead and go look in the top left. This is the MPAD software. So we, again, use the 128 by 128 MPAD, uh, originally developed under the art of Cornell. This software lets us control all of the exposure times, take our backgrounds, do the step size calibrations that were, were being talked about earlier, and also shows off some of the, uh, the, the features of, of 40 STEM that weren't really talked about in the advanced data discussion. So let me go ahead, unblank everything, and make this thing start working. So right ahead, this is just uh, the direct beam that we're capturing here. You can see all the Kikuchi bands in the pattern. This is just using it as a regular uh, diffraction camera, like you could use a, the ultra scan uh, that the Titan comes equipped with. Where it starts to uh, come into its own is you can start doing scanning. And you can see out in the, just realize I can't point, I should use the mouse. On the bottom part of the image, this is a bright, uh, this is a bright field image. The bottom part you can see is vacuum. And then as it passes over the sample in the top, you can see the diffraction patterns move as uh, there's a slight bend to this sample because it's very thin. Uh, one of the great things about doing a 40 stem data set that makes this a little less intuitive to visualize is I can just change the virtual detector, which is just changing what region of the diffraction pattern we're actually counting when we're doing uh, the integration, which is creating a, a virtual, in this case, HADF image, LADF image, bright field image, DPC image. And we can generate all of those off of the same data set. It's, uh, and not only that, we can later just go, oh, so we want to change the, uh, the angles that we're uh, working with to match a simulation. Uh, yes, this is a BTO sample uh, for clarification to answer the question that was going on there. So we're going to go in and see if we can't get some atomic resolution images going on here. So the other thing you'll notice is this is very slow. Any of you who've worked with uh, uh, regular traditional STEM instruments, are noticing that this is a very slow acquisition, very long dwell time, and a very low resolution image. And, and there's a couple reasons. You say slow, no. how slow is slow? What are uh, your typical dwell times? The dwell time, if we're operating in HADIF using Velox, we get down to 500 nanoseconds. 
Our normal acquisition is between one and 10 microseconds. The fastest this particular camera operates is one millisecond acquisition time. So it's a factor of a thousand um, slower. Uh, the other reason is the reason that we have such small resolution, that this is only a 64 by 64 image, rather than the uh, 1024 by 1024 in that DPC, is every single position we're storing a 128 by 128 image. And so data sizes just blow up rapidly. Uh, this image in IDPC takes up nine megs of space. A 1024 by 1024 image acquired in MPAD takes 16, 64 gigs of space. No, sorry, that's only 16 gigs of space. I was thinking of the 2048. And so these data sizes rapidly just get out of control. Um, and it's just something that you have to take into account when you work in 4D STEM, as well as uh, one of the big things that you want to think about when you're do, acquiring your data is camera length. Normally in STEM, our camera length just adjusts the uh, collection angles that fall onto our haddock detector. In 4D STEM, it's adjusting the uh, basically the, the sampling of the diffraction pattern on the camera. I just got to get back to the edge so I can actually get the focus in here. And this is the slow, the slow refresh time is honestly one of the biggest challenges to working with 4D STEM. That and uh, once you can see the diffraction pattern captured at every single point in your sample, you become very, very acutely aware of how much bending there is in even a nominally flat sample. Uh, because every single little bit of distortion you can see in the Kikuchi bands as it's scanning across. Come on, there we go. Now we're getting focus. And the magnification is still low, right? It is. Um, but I wanted to get the edge lined up before I went in to get the rest of the magnification. There we go. I can see some lines. Yep. What we're seeing right now is actually a, a, a false signal that's not quite uh, looking at lattice yet. We're not at nearly a high enough magnification. But this, on the other hand, it's noisy because there's two of us in the room and it's the middle of the day. But now we can observe the changes that are going on in that diffraction pattern as we raster it across the atomic lattice. And then very easily go to LATIF, go to HADIF, and look at the DPC in both directions um, on the diffraction pattern. And you can do this with microprobe mode, and you can look at the internal structure as it's going across. Um, acquiring with separated disks, we can increase the camera length so that we can make out more detail in that center pattern. Give it a second to catch up. There we go. That's center back down. It all depends on what, uh, going back to one of the things I said earlier, and I'm very fond of saying, uh, the correct settings for the experiment depend entirely on what you're trying to do. Uh, we showed uh, in three talks, about five different purposes for 4D STEM. All of them have a completely different optimal setup for the scope. Uh, one of the uniform things is you want a really thin sample for any time you're doing any sort of electric field work. But this is the general, we're out of focus. Yeah, maybe it's better to switch to the bright field. Uh, it, it doesn't like it when I talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, this is very much a, this is how it works. What questions do you have about operating 4D STEM? Uh, you can raise your hand, I can call on you, you can put it in the chat, questions, comments, troubles that we run into. Who does the combination of the, oh, nope, that was the one that got answered yeah, earlier. That's the previous question. So basically taking a 4D stamp is as simple as this, but uh, uh, you didn't see what's behind this, right? Yeah. Behind this is the tuning of the correctors and the alignment of the microscope and also the stabilization of the sample. So uh, normally also, when, you, when you load in a stem sample, you might think of leaving it to rest for an hour, hour and a half to allow thermal drift to cancel out. 
realize that due to the dwell time on 40 stem, uh, the drift contribution is between 100 and 1,000 times the magnitude that you get in uh, traditional stem. As traditional stem, you're doing again that one microsecond dwell time. So each row goes by very quickly. Any drift that you have in your sample is going to show up very prominently in your data sets. There was a question that was submitted previously um, uh, online before the webinar. And either Wenpei or Tim, you might be able to answer this. Is uh, The question was about nowadays, we're, like, we're moving from pixelated detectors where you get the full field of view, right? And we also have quadranted detectors, but a lot of times now you see detectors with, say, maybe 16 quadrants, different rings um, that are quadranted, or I think there are some that have like, uh, rather than being quadrants, they're like, um, you know, six to yeah. eight pizza oh. slices. And nested um, geography, so you have rings of segmented detectors. Yeah. What are the, uh, do you see anything beneficial from that? I mean, obviously they're making them for some benefit, but like what kind of, what do you get out of that? So, so probably you can just show the DPC image yeah. really quickly. Oh, uh, it's, I don't have the, the instrument currently tuned for IDPC, but IDPC uh, is what those segmented detectors really enable. You can do electric field mapping at the speed that you do HADIF, and in fact, simultaneously uh, acquired with HADIF. This data set in the top right has a HADIF image, an IDPC image, a DPC image showing the direction of deflection, and just all of this data that gets acquired at the same speed as HADIF. When you increase the number of segments on your detector from uh, four, so you only have two different vectors. It's so you're measuring space. A minus C, B minus D, and figuring out your deflection from that to eight to 16. You're increasing the fidelity of the measurements. And so it's going to make IDPC data acquisition better and DPC acquisition better. But those techniques are an approximation of the first moment imaging that, they were that we were talking about earlier in 4D step where you're uh, capturing the entire beam and you're measuring the actual dis uh, distribution of the electrons in the beam as it passes through an electric field. Yeah, Professor Noyashi Bata from uh, Tokyo University in Japan, he actually has a, a really good review or just a research article talking about these differences, the uh, advantage and the disadvantage of different types of detectors. Uh, what, we, what you can do with this uh, uh, more segment segments of the uh, annular detector is that you can calibrate the intensity for each of them. And you can basically simulate what is going on with the 40 stem detectors. Uh, I would say it's, uh, it's pretty accurate with the increased number of the segments in the detector. But still talking about the flexibility of uh, you know, uh, analyzing the diffraction patterns, uh, probably 40 stem is better. Makes sense. I'm interested to see what the uh, the radial component gets you. The uh, you know the kind of slicing and the different um, you know going from four to six and so on makes sense. But I've seen some where it's like layered radially as well. Um, yeah, I'll read up on that. We had one question uh, in the chat. The typical step size we use for this that depends entirely on the size of the feature that we're trying to map. So for um, atomic resolution work, we want to get our step size as close to uh, what you would traditionally see in HADIF uh, as we can when we're doing, uh, I do micro probe mapping on barium titanate. At that point, I'm using a, a 2.1, uh, 2.4 angstrom step size because I want to be sampling about two times per unit cell. And so the big thing that you get that you need to take into account with 4D STEM is you don't want to acquire more data than you need to necessarily because as you increase the the spatial resolution, the uh, sorry, the uh, total number of sampling positions, you balloon up the file size and you increase the compl complexity of actually processing the data. That was something that the last talk was talking about where anytime you can shave speed in data processing these, it's huge because of the sheer number of patterns. Uh, I mean. A 128 by 128 is 16,000 patterns. When you get up to 512 by 512, it's 
200 some thousand patterns that you have to process. Yeah, probably now you can take some time to set up the DPC if you like, uh, okay. and uh, we can still answer the questions. The other concern with the uh, number of pixels or the size of the step is uh, how much dose you want to use for some low dose experiment, you know, uh, with uh, beam sensitive material, we actually want to reduce the dose and dose rate. In that case, uh, we want to reduce the, the number of uh, pixels that we acquire and increase the step size as long as they are like overlapping. Uh, I mean, as long as they are overlapping the areas you probe uh, each step, then you have enough of the information to do, uh, for example, typography type of work. Um, for data processing, there are commercially available software. There's, uh, I believe, 40 STEM Explorer uh, that the LeBeau Group put out is on his GitHub and on the App Store if you have a Mac. It's really good for virtual detector work, uh, like I was showing where we would do the bright field, dark field. Uh, all of my data processing is done in Python. Uh, I do all of that by hand. Uh, so what is commercially? Code. Yeah, what is commercially available, uh, available ones are the uh, MPAD, if you have the MPAD detector. So it, it comes with MPAD PC. The other one that's available is uh, uh, using Catan Digital Micrograph. So they have a plugin that can allow you to analyze the body stem, either for mapping the screen or seeing the electric field. So what we will do is, uh, if you like, we will post uh, some of the data we acquired today or previously uh, to the GitHub, and then we will share with you the information on how to process it. Then you can download the data and play with it. Okay, at the meantime, uh, when Tim sets up the microscope for DPC imaging, any other questions? Working on it. Have you all done any work with uh, the higher order Lowy zones and deep in um, 40 stem on the MPED? Does it look nice? Yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't analyze the higher order Lowy zones, but I believe there are some uh, works in. Let me see. Uh, Seen some, I think, in LSMO. What was the paper I sent to you? That's from. Uh, Oh, I wish I could, uh, I That's from AMAT, I believe. Filtering measured in the higher zone yeah, there's oh, a team. Yeah, there's a team from AMAT uh, in Belgium. Uh, they work on the ana analysis of the higher order Lowy zones, the host lines, and also the Kikuchi lines. And uh, I think Professor Dim, uh, David Muller's group, they also have some uh, work done with mm -hmm. analyzing the host lines. Yeah, that's right. I think Chris put it there. So what's going on right now is I'm just, um, we have a segmented detector. And so when you're doing IDPC, you need to be really careful that you start out, since what we're doing is measuring the difference between two different sets of the detector, that you start out with a really nice even beam, you have uh, similar sensitivity on all four detectors. So the scope lines that are going across right now is just measuring in a vacuum with no deflection, do we get an even signal on all of the detectors? And we have to tweak those just a little bit so that not only the overall value is the same, but the uh, magnitude of the noise is the same. Yeah. It's a little hard to see the mouse. What he's talking about is in the bottom right, oh, the green yeah. scope lines there. Um, <laughs> the, the difficulty of trying to show what's going on on six monitors on one screen. Uh, yeah, so these are the four uh, detectors. It's it's generating an image scanning on each one. Right now it's just noise because I have the beam out in vacuum. And then when we go ahead and we start changing over how we're processing the data, what we now have is a HADF signal in the bottom left, calculated IDPC in the bottom right, the A minus C component and the B minus D component. So these are orthogonal estimations of the, uh, the offset of the distribution of the electron intensity. And one thing that uh, these measurements are really sensitive to is dislocation. As you can see this big, beautiful dislocation running right through the middle of where 
uh, just below where we're going to work. Which adds its own layer of complexity. Let's see if we can get the focus right real quick. Is that because there's like a um, an electric field associated with the strain or some it's type of uh, anti-phase boundary there? When you're doing the IDPC, you're measuring, um, you're effectively integrating chunks of the diffraction pattern. But since we have all of these overlapping, overlapping disks in the center, if you go chain from being on zone to slightly off zone, you're increasing the intensity on one side in one of the diffraction spots while decreasing the intensity on the other side. So you get a false signal in IDPC or a signal that you have to kind of deconvolve from the electric field of tilt. Uh, IDPC is tilt sensitive because you have diffracted disks in with the main beam in this situation where we're using a 17.9 milliradian uh, convergence angle. But if we look at the data, this is, when I stop talking, it'll actually show up. But this is live acquisition, high, uh, high refresh rate. Let me just share this screen. But what's talking is going to throw this off. So I'm going to talk for a second and then go back to it. In the HADIF, we can't see any oxygen columns. We can literally only see. Uh, He's going to try and adjust the zoom on the uh, the, uh, the magnification on the screens out there so you can see this a little better. We can't see the oxygen columns, but IDPC is light element sensitive, as is center of mass imaging. Uh, you can do a, a similar uh, execution there. A little blurry because, again, it's middle of the day, but Let me just show you the, the data that was acquired earlier in the top right. Still a little drifty because it was acquired in the middle of the day, but we have, if we look in the top right, we have the, uh, the barium columns, the titanium columns, and nothing here. Barium column, titanium column, oxygen column acquired in the, uh, the IDPC. It's still sharing my course. Yeah, it's, it's not sharing with the LC, so. yep. Zoom in on that one. Yeah, there we go. And so this is the displacement mapping uh, done via color wheel, where we have um, a barium atom, a titanium atom, and kind of masked in the middle uh, is a lovely little oxygen atom and the deflection uh, from the electric field locally around it. So probably we can just stop talking for you know, five seconds and we can it's, it's not showing. It's not showing well. It, the Titan's doing well today, but it's it's the middle of the day and there's two people in the room. Yeah, and it's, it's always nice if we can operate the microscope uh, in, in another room, that's yeah. right. The, the increase in data fidelity you get, even between me sitting silently in this chair alone and me sitting in the next room clicking acquire is large. Does anybody else have any questions about DPC, IDPC, 4D STEM data acquisition? Want to throw back questions to the other talks? We can, uh, I believe some of the speakers are still here. Okay. Right. And otherwise, if nothing else, then probably that will be the end of this uh, microscopy live event. Yeah, I have a few comments uh, for the end of it, some more housekeeping things. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, all the speakers uh, for giving the great talks and everybody for attending. Uh, Wempe and Tim, thank you very much for that wonderful live demonstration and uh, great explanations uh, as we went along. Um, so a couple of reminders. Um, make sure that if you have not renewed your membership, um, m and coming up, make sure you renew that membership. Uh, for students, we have a reduced price. It's 20 for MSA, and you can do a for $5 more. You can do a dual membership with MSA and MAS. Uh, we would, uh, the Student Council, we host a pre meeting Congress every year. And in order to do that, we have um, lots of sponsors that we would like to thank. 
uh, our current sponsors uh, for these talks as well as the pre-meeting are Thermo Fisher Scientific, MSA and MAS, Protochips, uh, Joel, TSS Microscopy, Direct Electron, and Nyon Company. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please go to our website and or email us. Our email is on the website as well. Uh, it's just studentcouncil at microscopy.org. Um, this video will be uploaded to YouTube later on. Uh, so if you have any, uh, if you want to go back and uh, see something, if you think you missed it or just want to refresh, you can always go to the microscopy live um, section of the Student Council website. As well as I think, Wempe, you said that you will be posting some of the live data acquired today and um, some analysis. Yeah, we can, what we will do is that we can update the, the post, right? Maybe in the, in the comments area in the YouTube channel and you can see where the data is. Yeah, so then you can just visit the YouTube channel and follow that link to the, uh, the actual data and analysis. That would be great. Uh, so yeah, thank you again to everybody, speakers and attendees alike. Um, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too, Eric. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us in the lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>